Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. We'll begin shortly. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on parenting during the pandemic. The top four strategies to increase student motivation, what every parent should know. This webinar is sponsored by the Northeast and Caribbean Mental Health Technology Transfer Center, or MHTTC, housed at Rutgers in the School of Health Professions in the Department of Psychiatric Reha Rehabilitation and Counseling Professions. My name is Kathy, and I'm the project coordinator of the center. We'll be facilitating this webinar today. The MHCTC is funded by SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, to enhance the capacity of the behavioral health and other related workforces to deliver evidence-based and empirically supported practices to individuals with mental illnesses. Please visit the MHCTC Network website for additional information at mhttcnetwork.org. Next slide, please. If you're interested in staying up to date with the events and products the Northeast and Caribbean is providing, MHTTC is providing, please sign up to receive our email communications. You can sign up at the bit.ly link provided on the screen. Next slide, please. Following the webinar, you'll be asked to complete a brief survey. We value this feedback and use it to improve our activities and inform future activities. The surveys are also important because our continued funding is linked to the completion of these surveys. So we thank you in advance for your feedback. I just want to let you know that this webinar is being recorded and will be posted to our website along with the PowerPoint slides in the next couple of days. We encourage you to interact with our presenter during the webinar by using the chat feature. Please post any comments or questions you have in the chat and I will collect your questions as we go and ask them of the presenter during the Q&A time towards the end of the presentation. During the webinar, our presenter may pose questions to you, so please use the chat feature to answer these questions. Next slide. This presentation was prepared for the MHTTC network under a cooperative agreement from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or SAMHSA. All material appearing in this presentation, except that taken directly from copyrighted sources, is in the public domain and may be reproduced or copied without permission from SAMHSA or the authors. Citation of the source is appreciated. The opinions are expressed herein are the views of the presenters and do not reflect the official position of the Department of Health and Human Services or SAMHSA. No support or endorsement of DHHS SAMHSA for the opinions described in this presentation is intended or should be inferred. Now let's begin our webinar. We have with us um, Ms. Christy Ritbalski with us today. Um, Ms. Ritbalski joined the MHTTC team in 2020 as a school-based training and consultation specialist. Prior to joining our team, she supported school teams with coaching, training, and technical assistance in the areas of social emotional learning, or SEL, school mental health, and positive behavioral interventions and support. She brings more than 15 years of experience in implementing and maintaining evidence-based practices in a variety of settings. She's passionate about improving the educational and social outcomes for urban communities. She has worked extensively in urban districts of Philadelphia and Newark, working within schools and partnering with many inner city grassroots faith-based organizations and local universities to align school-wide behavioral and mental health efforts with the community. So at this time, I just want to extend a warm welcome to everyone and I'll pass it over to our presenter, Christy. Thank you so much, Kati. Um, thank you for that introduction. Um, I should add just one more thing to that as well is that um, one of my favorite audiences to present uh, to is parents, especially because I am a parent myself. Um, and it is by far uh, one of the hardest jobs, but most rewarding. So um, good evening to all of you um, and welcome. Uh, before we get started, I also wanted to just really take a moment to thank our friends at the Virgin Islands Department of Health Project Launch for welcoming the MHTTC and myself here uh, today. Uh, before we start today's training, I want to really just, you know, be thoughtful and take a moment to recognize uh, how overwhelming 
and stressful the last year has been for all of us. I think it's really important um, to acknowledge that parents have been under an enormous amount of stress and pressure. And so with that being said, I just really wanna take a moment to commend you, one, for all that you do and for being here today. I do recognize that you could be anywhere else or doing a million other things, but you are here. So thank you so much. Uh, to prepare our minds for tonight's session, I invite you to engage in a really quick breathing exercise in order to get us in a calm state and relax our minds, especially, um, you know, it's, it's towards the end of the day, we may be coming from work, uh, we may even be getting ready to go to work. So just really participating in this um, deep breathing. So deep breathing is one of the best ways to really lower stress in the body. It sends a signal to the brain to calm down and relax. So in a few seconds here, I'm going to um, play a video. You'll see on the screen that there is a, um, as the ball completes the half circle, uh, we're gonna breathe in. And as the ball completes the whole circle, we're gonna breathe out. And I'm gonna kind of guide us through this exercise for the next few minutes. You may also hear some music in the back, background, some calm, relaxing music. Um, Something else that you could do uh, during this exercise is even close your eyes and visualize maybe your, your favorite place, right? So it could be the beach. Uh, it could be, you know, a favorite uh, place that you remember in your childhood. Um, so here we go. a little bit more relaxed and ready for tonight's session. So one of the best things that we can do as parents is really model the behavior that we want to see. Uh, the more we model healthy coping skills to deal with stress, the more our kids will learn how to deal with stress better. And one of the things we can do as parents is to carve out time to really identify how we cope with stress. So one of my favorite activities, um, especially when I'm doing fam uh, family or parent trainings, is to really talk about creating a uh, family grounding kit. Uh, so very similar to like a first aid kit, a first aid kit has all of those little things that we need in the event of, you know, we uh, falling and maybe hurting ourselves or, you know, those minor little injuries that we have. Uh, the co same concept applies for a family grounding kit, uh, but it's really meant to take care of our, um, it's really meant to take care of how we're feeling emotionally. So as a family, identifying the things that help you feel relaxed. Um, and one of the ways that we can do this is, and you can certainly name your kit whatever you like, it could call, be called a calm kit or a cool down box. Um, is finding a little box in your home. And I actually have my, uh, my family grounding kit that I use here with, uh, with my family that I'll share with you in a minute. But, you know, really using um, that to put those things that help us feel at peace, right? Those things that help us feel relaxed, maybe when we're feeling anxious. Um, so even taking that time and as a family identifying, identifying what those things are and putting them into a special place or in a box. 
And if one of those things is a special place that let's say you like to go to, maybe the beach, you can always include an item that represents that place, like a picture um, or, you know, or something specific from that, from that place. So um, I wanted to share with you. So again, I just use for, so for me and my family, we just kind of use a, an old shoe box, right? Um, that, that I had and um, I'm gonna hold it up here. I know it may be just a little bit difficult to see, but some of the things that we have in there are um, these little prayer cards uh, that we like to read together, maybe when we're feeling anxious. Um, one of the other things too is sometimes there are certain smells that make us feel calm and at peace. So one of our favorite smells is um, like the coconut oil or this famous um, lemongrass coconut oil that we really love. Um, you can even put in there things like stress balls or little stuffed animals. So I'm holding up something that's very near and dear to me that somebody special gave to me. Um, and one of the other things that we really like to use in my house is actually um, journals, right? So we keep gratitude journals as a reminder of the things that we are really thankful for. So um, really quickly, let's just take a moment and type in the chat some things that you may put in your family grounding kit, right? Things that um, help to bring a sense of calm, happiness, and joy to your family. Um, it could be, I know another thing that we really enjoy is music, right? So it can even be music um, that really puts your family in, in a happy, good mood. So type some of those things in the chat. And I'll give folks just a second. Christy and um, our participants are saying that then they have the Bible, mm -hmm. two people, three people, the Bible, music, essential oils and music, pictures of family, family members. Yeah. That's nice. Thank Absolutely. you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for participating. Absolutely. And, um, you know, I know spirituality is so important and it really does help uh, create a sense of calm and bring us a sense of calm and peacefulness. So that's why we have um, those scripture cards in my box as well. Thank you so much for sharing. So today our objectives are really just to recognize the different types of motivation, um, explain practical strategies to increase student motivation and apply those practical strategies to real life scenarios. So with all of my trainings, I really like to take a strength-based approach. Um, and so as a parent, I know, like I said, this past year has been very stressful um, and being under an enormous amount of stress, it's so easy for our minds to kind of focus or gravitate towards uh, the negative, right? But I want us to take a second and really think about one to two positive qualities that your child possesses. Um, so really take a moment and think about that. When you have those qualities, I want you to really type your child's name and those positive qualities into the chat. And while you're thinking about that, I'll actually go first. Um, this is one of my favorite activities. Um, you know, I think as parents, we do like to, <laughs> we do like to have brag about our kids, right? And talk highly about them. But, um, so my daughter's name is Mackenzie. And some of the positive qualities that she possesses is I really feel like she is compassionate, um, very caring, and hardworking. So like I said, I really like to take a strength-based approach um, when I present to parents. And so let's just take a moment to really think about what are those positive qualities that you feel like your child possesses or your children possess? So some things could be, you feel like they are well organized, they get along with others, um, they're naturally caring and helpful. These are just some ideas. Dear Christy, in the chat, someone shared um, the name of their child is Damien, mm -hmm. and uh, Damien is empathic, helpful, and loving. Mm -hmm. and 
Someone else said that their son is genuine, compassionate, caring, and very particular. And Rio is his name. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. All right. So what is motivation? What drives us to get out of bed in the morning, right? For that 6 a.m. workout, if you, if you love to work out. Um, what drives us to get up and kind of go to work every day, right? So motivation really is what drives us to action. It's what um, really drives our behavior. And essentially, it's the intrinsic interests and tasks that we find enjoyable and personally relevant to us. Um, so we're all motivated by different things. Um, and I want to just take a second for us to really think about this and really think about what are some of the things that motivate you? And Kadi, I think this is a good time for us to launch our poll. Really think about what are some of the things that motivate you? So you'll see up here on the screen, it actually says what keeps you motivated, right? And we have different things that you can choose from. So recognition, money, social and interaction, purpose, um, excelling, you feeling energized, it brings you peace. Um, you know, there's all different types of things and there's no right or wrong answer, right? Like I said, we're all motivated by different things. All right, I see the responses coming in. Take your time here filling these out. You guys are such a great group. Thank you so much for your participation. Oh my goodness, I love this. So um, I have 100% of folks are saying purpose, right? It's something that really motivates them. Um, I would say coming in in second place after purpose is feeling energized, right? So it makes you feel energetic, keeps you going. Um, I would say, whoop, here we go. There we go. So they, okay, perfect. So we have some of them, actually, you guys can see the results here, which is really nice. And you see the, I, just like I said, our top two are purpose and feeling energized. I actually really like the fact that um, it brings you peace also came up very high as well and excelling. Awesome. All right. So uh, we generally group motivation into two different categories. We generally group motivation into two different categories, one being intrinsic motivation and the other being extrinsic motivation. So just to explain the difference between the two, uh, intrinsic motivation just means that you have a desire to complete the activity because it feels good to you. It's personally rewarding. Um, it comes from within. So for example, some people just really enjoy reading because it is an escape from reality, right? Reading can take you to a different place in time, depending on the book. Um, or they just really enjoy finding a quiet place to read and, and maybe just um, relaxing, right, with a good book. But extrinsic motivation means you're motivated to perform the task uh, to receive a reward or avoid a punishment, right? So using the same reading example, some people may not enjoy reading, but they still, let's say, attend book clubs. So what they enjoy is really the reward of social interaction and connecting with others or connecting with friends. Um, or another example as it relates to kids, maybe they, maybe they don't necessarily enjoy reading, but they'll read if they know that they're provided with some type of recognition for reading a certain number of books, right? So both intrinsic and extrinsic motivation drive human behavior and play a significant role in learning. And one is not necessarily better than the other. So I wanted to make sure that I emphasize that point as well. So for the purposes of today's workshop, we're really going to focus on strategies we can use as parents to help motivate our children. Uh, we'll explore each of these concepts in greater detail. So providing choice. So providing our, um, our children with choice will help create a sense of autonomy and help increase motivation when it comes to learning. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about positive feedback. So providing behavior specific praise, and I'll explain that a little bit more. Um, problem solving. So when things are hard, right? Helping our children really think of alternative ways to solve problems. And then goal setting. So designing systems that help your child really outline timeframes and track pro um, progress and, re and really meeting their goals and timelines. 
So we'll start with the first strategy, which is providing choice. Um, allowing for choice will let your child plan for learning in ways that are most motivating. So providing choice not only increases their motivation and um, independence, but also allows children to use and improve their communication and social skills. So one thing to note when offering choices, as the parent, it's still under your discretion, right, which choices you provide. Providing children with small choices now really helps to prepare them for difficult decisions that they may make or have to make later on in life. Um, giving kids choice really helps to teach responsibility and really develops a cause and effect awareness that all actions have a positive or a negative consequence. And I'll provide some additional concrete examples on the next slide. Um, so just some rules of thumb when providing choice is, you know, before Think about when to really use this strategy is before engaging in, let's just say, a less desirable or challenging activity. So if you know that your child maybe struggles with, let's just say, math, right, um, this would be a great strategy to use before, let's say, you're completing their homework with them. Um, and choice should be purposefully and uh, purposely planned and implemented. So this is just a little chart that really explains the different types of choice making opportunities that we can offer to our kids. Um, and so I'll kind of walk through a few of these just to give you an example. So when we talk about um, the choice making opportunities and the type between and among, that is just basically giving the child a choice of what the child is going to work on. So an example of that would look like saying, Oh, it looks like you have homework to complete for science, math, and reading. Which would you rather work on first? So that's an example of between and among. Where is just simply the location, right? Where your child would like to work or play. So where is, you know, giving them a look, um, the option to choose maybe where they would feel the most comfortable completing their homework or, you know, completing their schoolwork. Um, when is just time? So the time that the child would begin to work or play. Uh, the choice of when, so it even re relates to the choice of when the activity actually starts. Um, so, you know, maybe posing the question, do you want to start your homework now or within five minutes? But again, keeping in mind that these um, choice making opportunities are still within the parent's discretion as to what you offer to your child. So strategy number two is praise or providing feedback. Uh, I always like to say that praise is actually one of the easiest motivation strategies to implement, but probably the most um, underappreciated and underused. So children really develop internal motivation through praise. If you wanna increase the likelihood that a behavior will occur, the best way to do that is to provide praise. Um, there have been thousands of studies done on praise used in actually different settings, right? So used in education settings, used in uh, workplaces. And what researchers will generally do is they'll go into those environments, they'll observe the number of positive and negative statements. And then what they'll do is they'll provide simple feedback to the teacher or to the manager if it's actually in a workplace or even to the parent, right, around increasing praise statements. And what they actually have found is that when they do that, they see an increase in the student's engagement, or they'll see an increase in the employee's productivity, right? So that's just really something to keep in mind. But one of the examples that I love is um, when your child is, you know, keeping this in mind, even when your child is learning a new skill. And so I always like to use this example. I remember when my daughter was learning to walk and, she would hold on to anything, right? And I'm sure many of you remember this when your children were really learning to walk. And she would hold on, like I said, she would hold on to anything out of fear of falling, right? She would grab maybe the couch or, you know, she would grab the side of the table. Um, but when I started to provide that encouragement and praise, right? So I'm saying, oh, you could do it, you could do it. Yes, you could do it, right? And I'm sure so many families have done this. Um, she released her hands and her fears and she took her first step, right? So all that to say is that same concept applies even as our kids get older, right? 
and making sure that we continue to provide that praise when they're learning a new skill or um, when you see them engaging in a behavior that you would like to encourage or when your child's behavior matches your expectations. So here are some just uh, some tips around providing feedback. And while all praise or providing praise, and while all praise is good, right? Some praise is more impactful and powerful. So statements like great job and good girl don't really highlight the behavior. So that's why it's really important to use behavior specific praise and naming the behavior that you would like to see again. So for example, remember I said my daughter's name is Mackenzie. Um, I would say, Mackenzie, you did a great job cleaning up the kitchen tonight. Uh, that behavior specific praise, right, increases the likelihood that the behavior will occur again under similar circumstances, right? So if I wanna increase the likelihood that Mackenzie will clean the kitchen again, right, without me having to nag her, without me having to tell her more than once, right, I wanna make sure that I provide that praise to her in the moment when she's actually engaging in that behavior. Um, so one thing I wanted to mention as well is that praise should be genuine and sincere. Um, you know, it should be delivered immediately after the behavior occurs. And then once the behavior becomes intrinsically motivated, you don't necessarily have to provide that praise as frequently. So now I know what you are all thinking because I have presented these, these, uh, this presentation and this topic many, many times, and it comes up all so often, right? From so many parents that I work with and they say, well, why praise kids for something that they should be doing anyway? And so my response to that is oftentimes as adults, right? We provide inadvertent, right? So like without intention, we provide this like inadvertent reinforcement for doing the wrong thing. So I'll give you an example. And these are like some classroom examples, um, but I'll relate them back even to, um, you know, at home. So call, calling out in class, right, would gain a, stu a student, right, peer attention. Um, maybe being disruptive gets them out of doing the chores, right? Or another example is, Maybe even, um, you know, being silly and having your parents laugh at you, right, or having your siblings laugh at you now gains you that attention that you want. So we must ensure that our kids receive ample reinforcement or ample praise for the expected behaviors, for the things that we want to see, not just those inappropriate behaviors, right? So the idea is if we really wanna strengthen the behaviors that we wanna see, we have to provide that behavior specific praise. So really quickly, just to recap. Um, so I have some praise statements here on the screen and in the chat, I want us to try to identify what's the right praise statement. And I'm actually going to read these out loud just in case of, you know, just in case we have folks that are on the phone. Um, so the first statement says, so number one says, great job, right? So if you think that number one is an accurate praise statement, type number one in the chat. The second statement says, nice job cleaning the kitchen tonight. So if you think that number two is accurate, go ahead and type that into the chat. Number three says, I like the way you thought about that and figured it out. You figured out a good solution to the problem. All right, so I'll say that one uh, again. It came out a little funny. So number three says, I like the way you thought about that and figured out a good solution to the problem. All right. So if you thought number three was a good one, type that one into the chat. And then the last one, number four, says you did it, All right? You did it. So what do we think out of one, two, three, and four? And Katia, I can't see the chat box, so you may have to just let me know. What do we see? So, yeah. We have um, respondents that say number three. Um, like, that we have someone else that says number one, and num again, number two and three. Nice, and nice. Another one for number three. Awesome. Yes. Yeah, so right. So number two and three were the correct answers, right? And the reason why two and three are correct is because 
it provides the praise, but it also names the, the, the actual behavior, right? So number two says, nice job cleaning the kitchen, right? So the praise statement is the nice job. And um, right, the praise statement is the nice job. And then, you know, the actual behavior is cleaning the kitchen, right? Uh, number three, so it says, I like the way, right? So I like the way is the praise. And then the behavior is how you figured out a good solution to the problem. Nice job, guys. So strategy number three um, is all about problem solving. So we make decisions uh, every single day, right? From the time you know you woke up this morning until now, I'm sure you've had to solve multiple problems. Uh, just today alone. So some problems are fairly easy, right? Like deciding what to wear in the morning. And some problems are more complex. We know that as adults, my goodness. Um, if we give our kids the skills to effectively problem solve, what we do is we increase their motivation and resilience. So the earlier we can teach this skill, the better. Um, I've worked in many schools, um, some with, you know, some elementary schools with younger students, right, some um, secondary schools or with older students ages like 12 to 18. And I will say that, you know, this skill around problem solving is one of the ones that our older students struggle with the most. Um, partly because, you know, children lack the cognitive uh, problem solving skills. Uh, remember that, you know, really the brain doesn't fully develop until about age 25. So, you know, in teens brains, the connections between the emotional part of the brain and the decision making center are still really developing. But the best thing that we can do as parents really is to help foster right these healthy problem solving skills. And so, um, you know, what this strategy is really meant to do is it's designed to help children to slow down, to stop and think and really generate multiple solutions to any problem. Um, you know, one thing I always say is this is a great skill to practice, right? Before there is a major problem that happens, you can make up a problem and kind of sit down with your child and walk them through the problem solving steps. And I'll actually take us through those steps shortly. Um, but one other thing that I want to emphasize is kind of when to use this strategy, right? So you think about, you know, after you've been, after you spent some time actually practicing this, then you can use the strategy, let's say, when a task is too hard for your child to complete, or um, even when your child encounters social challenges, right? We know we see that happening, um, you know, in the in the early stages of middle school. So we're talking, you know, um, ages, you know, 10, 11. Um, and when your child is trying to find or they're looking for a solution to a problem. So um, these are the problem solving steps and not to worry. Um, at the end of this presentation, I will definitely drop a link in the chat. And I've created documents um, that have all of this material. So then that way you'll be able to pull them up either on your phone um, you know, or on your computer and to be able to go back and kind of reference them um, when you need them. So um, the problem solving steps uh, really just give your child opportunities to practice when they are not actively dealing with the problem, right? And so um, opportunities to practice this model will, like I said, kind of strengthen um, their ability to problem solve um, and, and really develop their problem solving skills. So, you know, you can apply this model in different situations. Um, like I said, schoolwork, problems with a sibling. Um, you know, to develop these skills, we know as adults, difficulties and problems arise. So keeping our children motivated really starts here. So I have an example that I'm gonna walk us through as you're looking at the, pro the problem solving steps on your screen. So you'll see that the first step says name, right? And that's just referring to naming the situation and really identifying what the problem is. So for my example, I am, I'm actually not gonna, I'm not gonna use my daughter's name this time, right? So I'm gonna use the name Ruth. 
Um, so we'll just say that Ruth is falling behind in her reading class and she's really feeling frustrated, right? So we've identified what the problem is. Now you'll see the second step is calm, right? And it just means providing a strategy where your child can engage and being able to come, learning how to really use um, those coping skills, right? Those coping strategies to be able to focus and think clearly. Because we know when we're feeling emotionally upset, it's very difficult to make decisions. And so if you remember, this ties in very nicely um, to the grounding kit that I talked about earlier on in the presentation. Um, so having your child kind of use, right, the family grounding kit that you've already developed and picking one of those things maybe out of the box to really calm themselves before they go into the problem solving, um, to the rest, into the rest of the problem solving process. Step number three is to identify. So identify just means to identify the outcome that they would like, right? So let's just say for argument of our example that, you know, like I said, Ruth is feeling really frustrated because um, she's falling behind in her reading class. And you know what? Her outcome is she really wants to get an A in this class. That's what she wants. Um, after that, the next th step is brainstorming, right? So helping Ruth Brainstorming is just things that you can do to accomplish your goal, right? So just really helping Ruth identify how she can accomplish her goal, right? And so that may be things like uh, reviewing the number of tests and assignments before grades are due, or, you know, maybe encouraging her to meet with the teacher and see if there are any extra credit opportunities that she could, you know, that she could do to help, um, to help get that A in the class. And then um, the next step, uh, which is step number five is to create. So one of the things that's really important is to create a plan of action. So having Ruth actually write down the steps that she's going to take, right? What are the steps that she's gonna take in order to ensure that she really gets that A in the class. And then step six is to execute, right? So to execute the plan. So to make sure that she actually follows through and then the last step is really just to reflect. So to, the, to reflect on how well the plan actually worked. Um, so one thing to remember and kind of learning this process um, or just kind of learning any new skill, right? Is in order to learn a new skill, it takes on average up to eight times to practice, right? For something before something actually becomes a habit. So, you know, again, um, a lot of times, you know, when working with our kids, we'll think, oh, they'll get it right away. You know, we'll show them one time and they'll, they'll have it down packed. But the reality of it is sometimes we really need to practice these strategies over and over again um, to really make it become a habit. And so um, strategy number four is all about goal setting, right? Um, so setting goals really reinforces the importance of planning. Um, this skill becomes extremely important, I would say, probably later in childhood, uh, but it's critical to really instill these practices as early as possible, right? Um, for younger students, this would be more um, short-term. So we could think of, you know, maybe some goals that they could do within um, a day or two. Uh, but for older students or, or for older children, I'm sorry, um, we usually say that their goals can be more long term. So maybe one or two weeks um, for younger children. You can still use this strategy, um, but instead of written text, one of the things you can you actually could consider is using pictures, right, to have students kind of draw out what their goals are. Um, and I know this um, strategy may feel right, like slightly overwhelming, um, but that's why I actually created a goal setting worksheet that you and your um, child can actually complete together. And so we'll take a look at that in a minute. Um, but really quickly, I just wanted to, you know, um, kind of go over, um, you know, some of the goal setting um, strategies that we can use, right? So one of the things to keep in mind is even when go walking your child through this worksheet, um, 
is just kind of asking them, right? Helping them to prioritize by asking certain questions. So what's the most important thing you need to get done today um, in terms of maybe their schoolwork? Um, you know, and even as saying, you know, you've been spending about 20 minutes a night on your science project or on your reading project. What's the maximum amount of time you can spend each night without necessarily feeling overwhelmed? And so this was the goal setting worksheet that I was referring to. Um, and like I said, not to worry, because I'm going to make sure that I drop this information into the chat for you so you'll be able to have it and reference it. Um, but one of the things that really keep in mind with goals or even completing large projects, especially um, in school, right, and it may feel very overwhelming to your child, um, you may even find that you see them getting anxious. Um, if your child is really struggling with those big tasks, one thing to help them do is just to break down those steps into a smaller checklist. Um, and so you'll see here, even the example that I have on the screen, um, you know, and I kind of filled it out just so you'll see how the form should be filled out is, you know, the first goal for this, um, for this child was to finish reading their book uh, for their book report that they had coming up. And it says, you know, what steps do I need to take? Well, and this is what I said, kind of breaking it down into smaller steps for them. Um, you know, I need to read chapters 10 through 12 and kind of pull out what those key points are. Um, you know, asking them how long do you think it'll take you to complete that? You know, this child said it would take about two hours and then asking them, when do you plan to do it, right? And then lastly, you know, making sure um, or asking them, did they actually complete the task? Yes or no? So in summary, um, I kind of share a lot of strategies um, tonight. Um, and so I wanted to do just a quick recap or a quick review of all the strategies that we reviewed. So the first strategy was choice. Um, and choice is just simply allowing, um, allowing for your child, right? Um, allowing for choice kind of will let your child plan for learning in ways that are the most motivating. Um, you can use choice when your child is about to engage in um, challenging or less desirable tasks. Um, and we talked about there are several different choice opportunities to select from, right? We talked about um, whom, so like, who would you like to complete those difficult tasks with, where, and we talked about when. Uh, the second strategy we talked about as well is praise. And I mentioned that praise is one of the easiest motivation strategies to implement, but the most um, underappreciated and underused, right? If you want to increase um, the behavior, right? You want to increase that positive behavior, we have to remember to provide that behavior-specific praise. The third strategy we discussed was problem solving. Um, so think about this, good problem solvers become great collaborators and leaders. So anytime I always think about problem solving, I think about, you know, um, all of our leaders. And even, even when we think about this pandemic that we're in, right, having to really use those problem solving skills um, to make sure, right, that we remain safe and that we're doing the right things. So that's my, that's my little mantra when it comes to problem solving is that good problem solvers become great collaborators and leaders. Um, so again, like I said, when it comes to problem solving and kind of practicing little steps is create opportunities, right, for you to practice the problem solving um, worksheet. Um, and remember to be patient, right, as your child kind of learns this new strategy or this new skill. And then lastly, we talked about goal setting. So set goals that are short term. Um, you know, we talked about kind of developing out a checklist for those goals that may feel overwhelming um, or things that they need to accomplish and kind of breaking them down into smaller pieces and how beneficial and helpful that can be. Um, and lastly, just really celebrate and rewarding kind of even those smallest wins. So um, I do want to just take a moment to, you know, kind of share one scenario and see what you guys think. So I'm going to read the scenario out loud and then we'll actually launch a poll and we'll talk about what, um, you know, what strategy do we think would be best to use for this scenario. 
So here it goes. It says, Ruth is a 13 year old girl who has always hated math. She often needs help completing homework assignments and gets extremely frustrated when she can't solve problems. Last night, Ruth was so frustrated. She took it out on her younger brother by screaming at him. I'm sure this example probably sounds all too familiar. So what strategy could we use to help motivate Ruth? She's feeling so frustrated, right? Math is not coming easy to her. She's overwhelmed. What strategy do we think we could use to motivate Ruth? And Kati, if you could launch our second poll, that would be great. Sure. Okay. So on your screen, you should see a poll. Um, it's a small window that pops up. Let's take our time. I see responses coming in. Great. Awesome. I'll give folks a second. Nice job. I see them coming in. I'll give it one more minute. A few more. Looks like we have. Um, yep, we're almost done. All right, so it looks like the number one response was, I hope everybody can see that there, problem solving. Nice job, nice job, absolutely. So one thing that I love about the problem solving strategy is it really, um, you know, it's an opportunity to really come together and walk your child through those individual steps and also incorporate um, some of those self-care, those, um, coping strategies, right, for learning how to deal with when we're feeling really emotionally charged and we're frustrated, right, because all of those are very normal feelings, but it's really about teaching our kids the skills to be able to manage those emotions enough to problem solve and come up with a solution. So absolutely, thank you so much uh, for participating in that poll. And then um, before we open it up for q and I just wanted to share um, one of my favorite quotes, um, the African proverb, it just says, train a child the way that he should go and make sure you also go the same way, right? Um, and, you know, like I said, one of the best things we can do as parents is really model the behavior we, we want to see. So even thinking about, like I said, how we cope with and manage stress, you know, how we're problem solving. Um, you know, how we're kind of navigating, you know, the difficulties of life and, you know, continuing to stay motivated. Um, just keeping in mind that our, our, our children are watching those things and how we deal with that. Um, so like I said, I shared a lot of resources with you this evening. Um, I know it'll be helpful to kind of have those, um, those worksheets that, it, that I provided. So I will make sure that I drop that into the chat. But right now, I just wanted to open it up to see if um, folks had any questions. And Kati, just let me know if you need me to go to um, the QR code or if you wanted to wait. So yes, thank you, Christy. If you could please move the slide deck over to the QR code. That'd yep. be great. So um, again, as I mentioned earlier, um, our, our uh, this training event is sponsored through the MHTTC and we're a grant funded program and as part of our um, grant funding, we are required to submit an evaluation for all of our training events and services that we provide. So if um, you would take a moment to complete this evaluation survey, I will also put the code or the link in the chat box for you um, while you prepare your question for Christy. Um, so I will type in the evaluation link in the chat box, which is easier for you to access. Um, 
so we um, we do have a question from one of our participants okay. that their three-year-old doesn't like to drink water. Oh. Um, uh, I, this person says, I praise him whenever he has done it on his own, but nowadays he's not motivated to drink water at all. I try to reward him with a game, juice, or his favorite TV show, but it doesn't work. So nowadays I, for, I have to force him to drink water. What strategies can I use to motivate him? So I guess building that intrinsic motivation to drink. Yes, and it's so hard too when they're younger. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's a, it's it's so hard when they're younger. I heard you say that you've, um, you know, you've tried to make it kind of like a fun, you know, like a fun activity, um, you know, try games and things like that. I would con consider, consider thinking about um, something that your three-year-old really, really enjoys, right? So I'll just use this as an example. So let's just say, you know, your three-year-old really, really enjoys watching, I don't know, something on television, right? Favorite, favorite show. Um, and I think what you'll have to do is say, you know, you have to drink water first, right? Before you can watch the show. So you may have to tie it to something that your three-year-old really, really loves and really, really enjoys. Now you'll notice that you may have to start off that way in the beginning, but then over time, you won't necessarily need to do that. So that's a strategy to think about using um, that, may be, that may be helpful, but keep in mind too that what you'll find, especially when we're uh, dealing with behavior is, in the beginning, you're going to get a lot of resistance, right? And sometimes what happens is parents, once we get that resistance, we back off and we don't continue on with the strategy. And that's actually one of the worst things we can do. So just try to be persistent, you know, continue to be persistent with it. And you should see change over time. It does take a while though. I think I said that to learn a new skill, it takes about eight times to practice that skill, but then to unlearn, right? Like um, a behavior and replace it with a new behavior. Um, or the literature tells us it takes up to 25 to 30 times, right? Of practicing and you know what I mean? Over and over that, that new skill in order to make it a habit. So just keep with it. I'm sure over time that that behavior will improve. Thank you, Christy. And that, as I was reading that, I also noticed, you know, it that the child is three years old. So of course, it, there will be some challenges yes, with so young. Yes. Um, and then I'm just going to address a few questions that came in in our um, registration. Um, oh, okay. so, um, someone had mentioned how to keep students motivated with extracurricular activities and minimize screen time. Yes. Oh my goodness. This comes up all the time. I know with technology and computers and phones and, and yeah, all these devices, it can be extremely difficult. So one of the things that I always tell parents is um, to create technology free zones um, in your, in your homes. And so um, that just means like establishing a zone in the house where electronics are not allowed. So whether it's a cell phone or a laptop, right. Um, so that could be, um, you know, at the kitchen table or at the dining room table or, you know, or during, during certain times. Um, the other thing that I always recommend too is um, setting aside time to unplug as a whole family, right? So that goes back to that modeling piece that I was talking about. And sometimes as adults, right? Like we forget that our, our children are watching us. And so, you know, what we, what I actually like to do is really unplug you know, maybe two hours before we go to bed. And then, you know, kind of setting up a family agreement. We're going to put our cell phones or we're going to put these devices into one place. Um, and maybe that's, you know, a place that's away from where we sleep. Um, so then that way we're not necessarily, you know, using those things um, during that time. The other thing I can't stress enough is, um, and I feel like, you know, we've gotten away from this is, you know, being intentional about planning family time and encouraging other activities to kind of do together as a family. 
which, you know, obviously, you know, once we do that and we're intentional about that, um, the technology isn't as much of a distraction. So I hope I answered that question. I know I kind of went on and on there, but. <laughs> okay, yes. Well, there's always um, so many um, strategies out there that people are now becoming more creative. Like I've heard of a, um, at the dinner table, all the cell phones go in a basket and they go, get put away. Um, so that that way the parent is also modeling mm -hmm. or the child or the children that they are also disconnected for that moment from technology and have full presence at the dinner table. Yeah, or even making it fun too. You can even turn it into like a challenge, right? Let's see who gets right. out there for the longest, you know? So then whoever wins gets to pick what, what favorite meal they want to eat, right? Because um, we all love to eat, right? So like what meal they want to eat um, for dinner. They get to pick the meal that's cooked for dinner. I mean, there's so many fun, like you said, Cotty, so many fun creative ways that we can encourage our kids, you know, to kind of step away from the technology. But that's such a good question. Thank you for that. Absolutely. So let's see. I think we have time for one more question. Um, okay. And I want to make sure I share the Padlet too. Okay. Um, go ahead, Cotty. I'm sorry. Just it's watch. okay. Um, someone is asking, what are some self-soothing techniques that can be utilized to support students who are fear feeling irritable yet need to be present or seen during virtual classes? Um, so this person is describing the, the behavior as irritable, mm. uh, which can also be seen as frustration maybe, especially during this uh, very challenging time and during COVID, but that was the question. They used the term irritable. So there could be many factors that might be contributing to the irritability, but oh, they, they want, they're really interested in, in self-soothing techniques. Yeah, so, um, what, so I, two things, right? I think that, um, there's been a huge push in education for brain breaks is what they call them. Um, you know, I think it's, it, it is very difficult, right? Even to, even in, in this virtual space, right? To be behind a computer the entire day for school or even to be physically in school, you know, and not have that opportunity to take a break. Um, so I would definitely say, you know, trying to um, make sure that your child is, you know, even if it's those uh, 15 minute breaks um, in between classes or, you know, 10 minute breaks um, to engage in, you know, maybe it's just um, stretching or maybe it's just a quick walk, right? If you, if you happen to be home with your child. Um, I think that's important too. But one other thing to, to keep in mind, especially when um, children are feeling like irritable or anxious um, is, you know, to think of sometimes some kids concentrate uh, better when they're allowed to have something to fidget, right? And so when I say that, I mean, um, you know, maybe they're you there you can have allow them to have like a stress ball in their hand, or um, you know, it could be something very small, right? Um, something very small and tangible. Um, that they're able to use as they're sitting through the lesson sometimes can be really, really helpful as well. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Definitely. I've seen the fidget, some, a fidget device or something that allows them to fidget to really, I guess, yep. express that excess energy that they might yeah, have. And some schools are even moving towards different types of seating. I don't know if you've seen that, right? Where it's like, they don't sit in a regular chair. It's almost like um, they have, you know, certain type of balls or, you know, it's like different things um, instead of like the standard way of how we, right? Like how we grew up when we, you know, the standard practice of you sit in your chair. Um, and, you know, the reality of it is all of us, we don't learn the same, right? And that's what we've learned over time and through research, all of us learn differently. Um, and so just keeping that in mind and, you know, at least being open-minded to giving your child, you know, those things to support their learning, even if it is something like a fidget. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much. So um, I just, I guess we're at the, just at the hour and I wanted to respect everyone's time. And I just also wanted to say thank you to all 
um, the participants today for you know all of your engagement, your participation, and the feedback. Such wonderful feedback that we received in the chat, and um, and thank you, Christy, for um, such an engaging webinar um, and all of the information and strategies that you provided, especially since they're very practical and you also showed how how you know what this might look like you gave concrete examples which i think our participants were able to relate to so thank you um, um i just wanted to add one last thing so this is a series um and so we still have two more additional workshops so next uh, wednesday april the 21st from six to seven um, my colleague pj winger who is amazing um, will talk to all of you about creating resilience in children that will foster their potential and increase their success in the world and then i'll be back wednesday april the 28th from six to seven to talk about emotions matter so social emotional learning at home and in the community um, and so yeah like i said thank you so much for joining um, if you have any additional questions, um, you can certainly email us um, to, you know, to, to reach out and we'll be more than happy to incorporate that into the trainings going forward. And thank you again for all of your participation. Thank you all. Thank you so much. So um, again, I will be following up with the registration link for the following webinars um, so that um, you have them available to you as well as um, a link to our presenter slides, a certificate of completion, and a link to the recording. Yes, um, and Cody, maybe if we could follow up too with that Padlet link for it, because for some reason I couldn't, it wouldn't okay. allow me to copy and paste it into the chat. But sure. if we could follow up with that as well, so folks can have the resources, that would be wonderful. Yes, definitely. Thank you so much, all, and we hope you have a good evening. We hope that you also stay safe and well. Um, during this time and, you know, we send our warmest greetings to you. Yeah, take care now.